Introducing the new Grace Sense Predictive Maintenance line of smart devices for the Industrial Internet of Things, or IIoT. These new Grace Sense products combine low power wireless smart sensor technology with advanced data analytics to help asset managers maximize the impact of their maintenance budget and protect their high value assets from unplanned downtime. By remotely monitoring critical equipment and issuing SMS or email alerts when anomalous or problematic behavior is detected, Grace Sense technology can help improve productivity and reduce downtime in almost any industrial application. Equipment uptime directly impacts plant productivity and output. An unplanned shutdown due to failure of improperly maintained equipment is among the most costly scenarios a facility can endure. In order to curb this potential major economic loss, many facilities today use a wide array of maintenance methods that include routine physical inspections and condition-based monitoring in an attempt to spot equipment failure before it occurs. Leading indicators of failure typically depend on the type of equipment and can include changes in things like vibration, heat, power consumption, airflow, or pressure. The Grace Sense Vibration and Temperature node was designed specifically with these challenges in mind. By focusing sharply on two of the leading indicators of failure in rotating equipment, the Vibration and Temperature node continuously monitors critical assets and can alert maintenance personnel in real time when it detects behavior indicative of bearing, rotor, or shaft degradation. These vibration and temperature nodes share their data wirelessly with any GraySense cloud gate located nearby. From there, local vibration and surface temperature measurements can combine with other measurement data like ambient temperature or current draw and push to either a local or remote cloud in order to improve the accuracy of the system's predictive capabilities. Once GraySense IIoT hardware is incorporated into a facility's preventative maintenance program, this technology comes to life through our web-based maintenance hub, which is used to configure the system, view current system status, analyze historical data trends, and generate periodic reports. The hub is also where users can create customizable alert messages with step-by-step -step remediation instructions designed to allow even new or untrained personnel to address critical issues as they arise, regardless of the time of day. The Grace Sense Predictive Maintenance line of products feature a flexible architecture combined with deep technical expertise employed by Grace Engineered Products and has already been proven in some of the world's most challenging operational environments, from long span bridges to U.S. naval warships. With so many possibilities for predictive maintenance on the horizon and a team of thought leaders at its helm, Grace Sense continues to provide innovative and scalable solutions to address the industry's ever growing demand for higher reliability and reduced maintenance resources. My name is Dan Ambray. Um, today we're going to have a little webinar on vibration analysis of rolling element bearings, uh, sponsored by Grace Engineered Products, obviously. Um, my name, Dan Ambray, my company is Full Spectrum Diagnostics. We do uh, ISO and ASNT training and certification. We also do diagnostics of rotating machinery. Um, everything we learn in the field goes into our training, so we get a lot of unique problems uh, and unique solutions. Um, we're going to talk about the stages of failure in rolling element bearings. And to get there, we have to first explore a few things about vibration. We're going to do a little bit of the basics, how training programs work, um, we're going to talk about uh, the vibration fault periodic table, how to classify faults with respect to frequency range and dominant vibration. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, ultrasonic vibration. So one of the early stages of the vibration uh, failure is in the ultrasonic stages. Typically, there's four or five stages of, fail of failure that people talk about. The first two or three uh, involve some ultrasonic energy indications that will show up um, as an early indicator of impacting and uh, lubrication problems. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about ultrasonics and we'll get into it from there. Okay, uh, so there is a little housekeeping to do. Uh, the synopsis for this presentation, the rolling element bearings include three distinct rotational events that can be measured with vibration methods. Uh, these events include the rotation of one or both raceways, Typically, it's the inner race that rotates with the shaft, um, the rotation of the bearing cage that separates and guides the rolling elements, 
and the spin of the rolling elements themselves. And as most rolling element variants fatigue and approach their useful life, they experience five stages of failure. Uh, these failure patterns are what we're going to talk about today. Um, a lot of people out there will teach that there's four stages of failure, but recently, and with the onset of a lot of wireless uh, permanently mounted uh, transducers, we're seeing uh, an initial stage. So the stage zero would be a break-in stage where we're, we're um, effectively rolling and smashing the, um, the machining marks on the bearing. And it can cause a, a change in ultrasonic energy and we're, we'll talk about that. So our uh, patterns of failure are five stages instead of four. Uh, some of the learning objectives. So vibration analysis basics and nomenclature. We're going to uh, talk a little bit how uh, the programs are trended and what frequency ranges we're interested in. I have here synchronous, harmonic, and non-synchronous frequency groupings. The vibration uh, of bearings are non-synchronous. Okay, they're not directly related to the shaft, and we'll we'll reinforce that over and over again. But that's the uh, frequency grouping that we'll be mostly interested in. Um, we're going to identify bearing defect frequencies in the velocity spectrum. So give you an idea of how they're uh, how they behave when you actually see one. Um, we're going to talk about ultrasonic impacting and friction, and then we'll get into the five sta failure stages and walk through those. Uh, the last little bit, I'm assuming I'll have enough time if I talk fast. We'll talk about the contributions of the low speed bearing failure in the time waveform. Uh, sometimes you can use the time waveform to confirm what you already know, or if you have really low speed bearings uh, and you have a cracked raceway, you might not ever see it in the frequency spectrum, but you'll see it in the time waveform. So we'll, we'll hit on a lot of these basics as we walk through this. Basic vibration. So I got a little seven step uh, card here. Uh, first, uh, the machine of interest. This is a direct driven overhung fan. Uh, we're going to measure it with a calibrated transducer. So step two is the 100 millivolt per G uh, transducer that we'll put on our machines. Uh, we're going to want to me measure axial, horizontal, and vertical directions on each bearing housing. Not that we're expected to find bearing defect frequencies all the time, but there's also unbalance and looseness and misalignment, things like that that are, are more common that you'll see. Uh, the bearing defects uh, that's what we'd like to see, because if we have an unbalance, we can balance it. We, if we have a misalignment, we can correct that. If we have looseness, we can shim things and get rid of that. If we have bearing damage, it doesn't go away. It's part of that uh, progression to failure. So it might be early damage, which we can uh, help with lubrication, but um, uh, we want to be able to see all these different faults in the, in the bearing housings and that's where the most vibration comes out. Uh, step three, analog output from the transducer. Uh, we'll get a, a pure stream of voltage versus time, and then we'll calibrate that with the transducer. So 100 millivolts per G, we'll get a uh, acceleration versus time waveform that comes out. And what I have shown there is just lots of wiggles, and it's a time waveform with multiple frequency components in it. Uh, step four, the analog signal is sampled and digitized. We can't bring the whole thing in, but we can uh, sample it at a high enough rate that we reproduce that original analog signal in the frequency ranges we want. So that's another step in the signal processing. Once we have that digital processing complete, uh, step number five is we put it through the FFT processor or the FFT fast Fourier transform algorithm. This effectively strips the periods out of the complex time waveform. So now we can see uh, like a, underneath here, the low level wave, we can see maybe one times RPM, maybe you can see a higher frequency showing up, and we can convert these from periodic events into frequency as one over the period. We can go into the frequency donate domain. Now we can look at the, the peaks uh, in the spectrum that relate directly to the wiggles in the waveform, except it's a lot easier to see. Uh, and then finally, we put our alarm bands on there and we can see how much is too much. And that's all part of the training program. So I'll jump through this in a little bit more detail. Know your machine. 
Uh, there's roughly 18 different machines listed here. These are all statistical analysis that were done to find the alarm levels for any type of machinery, basically. So cooling towers, compressors, fans, blowers, motor generator sets, chillers, turbine generators, and pumps. Okay. In my case, I have an alarm that's created for this direct driven uh, fan. Uh, the appropriate one, direct driven fans and blowers, 0.325 inches per second. That's the energy in the machine, the overall energy that we'd pick up. And it's drastically different from other machine types. That's why we have to group them uh, in like machines and um, do statistics on them. Number three, we're going to put our transducer on the bearing housing axial, horizontal, and vertical. We're going to map out what the vibration response is at each location, um, and we're going to be able to process that signal and figure out what's wrong with our machine. Uh, step three, the analog data stream. So we get a pure voltage versus time data stream that comes out of that. We calibrate it to our transducer to get acceleration versus time. Uh, we have a, uh, one of the GRACE uh, transducers here. Uh, a lot of walk-around programs will have a, a single transducer, and you'll take a measurement in each direction. This is a triaxial wireless accelerometer, so it uh, helps us uh, to collect all the data simultaneously. Um, and the nice part about this, you don't have to have a guy walking around to take the data. You can put some of these on your machine, and instead of getting 12, effectively 12 monthly measurements on a location, if you took measurements every hour, you'd have about 9,000 measurements on a location. Now you can trend that data. You can pick out things, uh, small failures that are progressing uh, instead of waiting month to month for a, a, you know, a very small amount of data. Um, digital signal processing. We sample the data at thousands of samples per second. We reproduce the analog signal. Um, and this effectively uh, defines the measurement maximum frequency range and the resolution in the data. We go put this uh, digital data into the FFT processor and we're effectively finding the periods of the vibration from the overall signal. We're extracting the simple sinusoids from the complex time domain signal. And doing so, we can identify the individual frequency con components in the time waveform. Very difficult to do a uh, time waveform analysis, very easy to do a frequency analysis. Um, and then the frequency spectrum that's generated, in my case for the periodic events shown over here, I stripped the FFT processor is stripped out three different periods that when added together, uh, recreate that complex waveform. Um, and it tells me an amplitude and a frequency where to put that in the frequency domain. Okay, what's still missing? We have allowable amplitude levels. We know this is a direct driven machine, so statistically we know how high our alarm levels will be. This is a band alarm uh, or a series of band alarms that are uh, very common for trending machinery. Um, I need to know what all the other peaks are. We'll get to a point where we have a peak in our spectrum. We don't know what it is. What we have to do is compare it to running speed or turning speed of the shaft. Okay. In this example, F2 is my rotational speed of the shaft. F1 is some uh, lower level, um, uh, not lower level, but lower frequency response in the machine. And here's another unknown frequency out where bearings uh, start to die uh, in F3. Uh, if I compare everything to running speed, I'm doing 8,025 CPM out here divide it by 1760 and I get 4.560 times running speed. Now it's not four times running speed, it's not five times running speed, it is 4.56, it's non-synchronous. So 4.56 times the 1760 is gonna be my 8025. So I've just classified this uh, frequency as a non-synchronous frequency. Uh, if I have a peak out here, I put my cursor on it, and it's one times RPM, it, it could be something else. It could be a slightly off in frequency, but 1760 divided by 1760 is one time. So it's the turning speed of the shaft. The third one, this lower frequency, 739 RPM, I divide it by running speed, 1760. 
I get 0.42 times running speed. This peak is subsynchronous. It's below running speed. It's also non-synchronous. So potentially I have two bearing faults, one out here in a higher frequency range and one over here in uh, the subsynchronous range. And again, there's my one times RPM. So biggest thing we have to do here, when we have a suspect peak in the spectrum, divide it, divide it or compare it to the turning speed of the shaft, the one times RPM, and we can see if it's a synchronous frequency, a harmonic frequency, or a non-synchronous frequency. And that leads me into my next topic. This is the vibration fault periodic table. It's a logical structure to vibration analysis. Um, I did a lot of this in my head uh, over the years where I would, you know, look at a spectrum and, and, and kind of guess what it would be. And I'm thinking, you know, this is taking too long. I should be able to do this a little more efficiently. So I came up with this table. Um, the columns uh, are the different frequency ranges. So I have synchronous vibration. I have harmonic, I have subsynchronous, I have non-synchronous, and I have modulation. So there's 35 problems in vibration rotating machinery, and they're put into five different categories. And this makes a lot of sense, and I'll show you just in a minute. But So we can define the frequency group, we can define the dominant directional response, we can perform recommended diagnostic tests, and we can narrow down the potential faults and get to the root cause of the problem. Okay, I just mentioned the frequency group. There's five of those. There's a dominant direction that we can get from the spectrum that we collect. So if I go back here and F2 is high in the axial direction, but not in the vertical direction, uh, my dominant uh, response is axial, which will come into play on the table here. Uh, the different colors are the directional group. So red is radial, yellow is axial, and Orange can be radial or axial, okay? But it's it's this process of uh, slowly finding our way to the answer. I have a couple examples, and I'll I'll be able to show you that in a second. First, the uh, the faults themselves, synchronous faults. They appear at turning speed of the shaft or one times RPM. If I find I have a large one times RPM, let's say my motor's running at 1760 and I see a peak in my spectrum at 1760 and it's in alarm, it's a synchronous problem, okay? That means that it's in one of these two columns. Uh, natural frequencies are kind of a wild card. They show up everywhere. But for all practical purposes, I've taken 35 faults and it's one of 12 now. So I've done a huge scaling problem there. I've uh, eliminated all the harmonics and the subsynchronous, the non-synchronous, the modulation type faults because they don't apply. They don't occur at turning speed of the shaft. Okay. Harmonic faults. These are exact multiples of the synchronous frequency, of the rotating frequency. Okay. The first column here, there's looseness, misalignment, and bent shafts. We'll generally... Uh, put out two times RPM. And notice there's a little bit of overlap between the columns. I'll have a high one times RPM, but I'll also have a lot of cases, a high two times vibration, exactly twice running speed. The middle section here is by design. So if I have a gear with 53 teeth, uh, I will get a 53 times running speed, exactly 53. If I have a, a pump with seven veins in it, I will get a seven times running speed, exactly seven. Uh, if I have a motor with 48 rotor bars, I'll get a 48 times. The third uh, lit up column here is looseness. So looseness is harmonic as well, but I'll get a whole string of running speed harmonics. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, they just keep going, okay? Um, it's uh, the way that um, loose bearings behave or loose shafts or what have you. Um, so that explains harmonics, exact multiples of the synchronous frequency. Uh, Subsynchronous, any fault that appears below the speed of the shaft, the rotating speed of the shaft. So these are all less than one times RPM. And I have some looseness problems that can generate that. I have rubs and gear problems. I have uh, journal bearing issues. I have belt frequencies and some electrical problems. There is one bearing defect frequency. Uh, the cage frequency in the bearing that's subsynchronous, and we'll get to that in a second. We have non-synchronous faults. 
there's, uh, let's see, 5, 10, 50, 15 different faults. So uh, there's five groupings of those. There's one of one of uh, the five um, frequency groupings, and then there's five different groupings inside that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm making this a little too complicated. Uh, all our varying fre defect frequencies are non-synchronous. So they are not exact multiples of synchronous speed. If I have a high 4.78 times running speed, uh, it's not four and it's not five. It's 4.785. It's a non-synchronous frequency. Sorry, I have to drill that into um, everybody's head, but it it's very important. Uh, the last uh, frequency range is modulation faults, and these occur as a beating frequency, so either an amplitude or frequency modulation, and they can generate sidebands in the frequency spectrum that we'll, we'll show you uh, in one moment. All right, there's radial faults. We talked about directional response being uh, important. Radial uh, faults are red on the table. They're either horizontal or vertical or both. Axial faults, dominant axial vibration is yellow. And orange can be radial or axial, okay? And many times it's a function of the design of the machine. Uh, best way to look at this is with an example. Uh, I have 35 potential faults. I find that my fault is synchronous. It's, it's occurring at shaft turning speed. I have an alarm. It says it's right at running speed of the motor. Um, it's considered a synchronous fault. There's 12 potential faults. So I've gone from 35 down to 12. Okay, the next step, what direction is the vibration? The fault is dominant in the radial direction. It's one of these four plus natural frequencies. So five potential faults. So I really haven't done a lot yet except look at a spectrum and I've gone from 35 faults down to uh, 12, down to five, okay? The third part of this, the table itself is telling us what to do. There's phase analysis, time waveform, orbit, transient analysis, ultrasonic analysis. Inside each block is one of those symbols. So these four have a phase icon in them. This one has a transient uh, icon in it. So we're going to do a phase diagnostic to see which one of these four might apply and weed out the other ones. And we're gonna do a transient analysis to see if uh, we can um, disprove our natural frequency problem, okay? And from this, you should be able to get to the answer, okay? And a lot of people don't know what the phase analysis is or orbits or transient analysis, that's for your vibe guy. This is a higher level sorting mechanism to be able to say, okay, this makes sense and it's logical. Okay, another example, 35 faults, uh, my fault is non-synchronous. So potentially it's a rolling element bearing fault. Okay, there's four of those in the non-synchronous category. So I have fifth, potentially 15 different faults. So I'll have to look into that and see which one is which. Um, four potential uh, rolling element bearing faults, so we'll, um, We'll disprove some of the other ones in those categories, and uh, these are the faults that we're, we're searching for. We can prove that if they have an ultrasonic signature. Ultrasonic energy doesn't go very far, and it's only something that really occurs in bearing frequencies, and it's due to uh, early damage and um, some uh, lubrication breakdown. So bad viscosity, water in your oil or grease, um, lots of things can cause it, temperature effects, um, and your ultrasonic energy can go up, okay? So the ultrasonic test or diagnostic is the best one to use for any rolling element bearing problem. Okay, uh, that's our background information. The quick slant through that, uh, we're going to identify bearing defect frequency in, in the velocity spectrum now. What is the velocity spectrum? It's the way we trend uh, rotating machinery. Velocity is in inches per second, and it's an amplitude format. Um, you can have trend acceleration or velocity or displacement. Uh, rolling element bearings, velocity is, is the, uh, in most equipment, velocity is the, the key parameter to use. Um, I'll direct you first to the little uh, animation going down here. I have the faults with little red dots. So if I have an outer race bearing defect frequency, I have a fault in the raceway. Usually it's in the load zone of the bearing in the lower half, and the balls are passing that. 
one after another. That's the rate that we're after. That impact rate is occurring. There's eight balls or so. Eight, bang, 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 bang. So it's a repetitive frequency that we'll pick up. We want to know what that impact rate is. If it's a defect on the inner race, that defect is moving with the shaft and it's passing each ball. So bang, 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 bang. It's a faster frequency, okay, a higher frequency. We also have a fault on the ball itself. The ball is spinning as it rotates around the bearing. Uh, this fault, uh, a lot of times it'll show up as the ball spin frequency, but a lot of times two times ball spin frequency because it has the potential to hit the inner race and the outer race every revolution of the shaft or excuse me, every revolution of the ball. The last that we don't see is the cage. The cage is the separator between the bearings and there's little pockets for the balls or the rollers. To uh, It's a guide, okay? If we have a broken cage, uh, it'll show up at the cage frequency and you'll notice how slow any element of the cage is moving and it's a little less than half of running speed. So here's my Cage frequency, these are some statistics. This came from a, a bearing database with 18,000 bearings, and the average is 0.42. So a little under half of running speed, uh, the subsynchronous range where cage frequencies will appear. Okay. I have a spectrum. Where, what do they look like in the spectrum? Something like this. I'll have an alarm band, series of alarm band, uh, profile to be able to uh, say what's good and what's bad in a bearing. I will make use of my harmonic cursor. I have a little square block here. If I This is my harmonic cursor. It'll light up every uh, one, two, three, four, every order of vibration all the way through. And you'll notice uh, synchronous, it's one times RPM, so that's the fundamental. I have something at two times and three times running speed and four, five, six times running speed. I'm assuming. Uh, the best way to find out is put my cursor on it. In this case, I have something subsynchronous, 749 CPM. How do I know what it is? I compare it to turning speed of the shaft. So I divide it by 1784. That's what this is up here. And I get 0.42. It's non-synchronous and it's subsynchronous. I can look at my vibration fault periodic table. I can see what group it's in. I can narrow down all the possibilities. So it's very helpful, okay? Just for fun, I put my cursor on uh, the six time harmonic, it looks like, uh, 10,704, I divide it by 1784, and I get exactly six times running speed, okay? Uh, and finally, my one times is one times RPM. Okay, we'll know that. Okay, so that's a cage frequency, subsynchronous and non-synchronous. Uh, the ball spin frequency, this is the rate if this ball hits the inner and outer races. Um, and I mentioned before, two times ball spin might be something that'll be also present in the spectrum. Statistically, it's uh, in the range of 1.9 to 5.9, and it's usually about 3.88 is the average of where this will appear in the spectrum. Um, Speaking of which, uh, a lot of times it'll show up very close to three times and extremely close where we'll need a lot of resolution to be able to pick out the difference in those two peaks. So I have my uh, peak that I'm interested in with the red circle here. I put my cursor on it and it's 5441. I divide it by running speed, 1784. I get 3.049. And first thought in your head is, well, that's three times. No, it is not. You don't round them off, okay? If I had enough resolution and I looked in here and I, I could zoom in, this would be three times running speed. This is 3.049, okay? So don't make that mistake. They're always non-synchronous, okay? But they can be close to another frequency and, and it would be, uh, with poor resolution, it'd be hard to pick them apart. Outer race defect, it occurs uh, in a range of 4.2 to 11.3. Uh, usually around 7.7 .7 times running speed, okay? Outer race defect is, usually appears in the load zone of the bearing, uh, and it doesn't move with the shaft, it stays put, okay? This is an example of that. I have a peak out here that I don't know. I have my same profile, I have blade passing very likely, a couple of harmonics. 
um, but this one is 14,619. I divide that by running speed, I get 8.194, non-synchronous frequency, okay? Uh, inner race bearing defect. This is the fault that moves with the shaft, okay? And it moves a little faster past the balls, and the balls are impacting it um, at a higher rate, so it's a higher frequency. Uh, its low range is 6.3 times running speed, the high range 13.8. Okay, so it, its average is around 10 times running speed, okay. If I look in my spectrum, there's a couple things we might see. This, uh, a couple learning things here, 17,563, uh, I put divide it by running speed, I get 9.845. I got another peak out here that's out in the wilderness. It's 35,127, divide by running speed, I get 19.69. Both are non-synchronous, but now we have to check, are they multiples of each other, okay? This is, this one is twice the 17,563, okay? So it's a harmonic of that fundamental bearing defect frequency, okay? This is how bearings fail. First of all, if it gets into the velocity spectrum and you see a peak and we can, it's non-synchronous and you can convince yourself that it's uh, a bearing defect, um, it's time to change the bearing. If you can see it in the velocity spectrum, there's enough damage that the bearing's failing, okay? No matter what the amplitude it is. If you decide you're not gonna do that, the progression to failure is it'll start generating harmonics of itself. So multiple, so this is two times the ball spin frequency and, and it'll keep going on and on. Another example, it might not get a harmonic, but it might get sidebands, okay? This is another failure mechanism. If I put my cursor on any one of those peaks, they're all non-synchronous, okay? They're all sidebands of each other though. I have 11.5 uh, is my middle frequency. I have plus or minus one times RPM, plus or minus two times RPM. Now, that's strange. This one is modulating. Okay, it's going, the fault itself is going in and out of the load zone. If we see where this is, I'll get a specific rate, bang, 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 that tells me what the frequency is, but it also has the effect of at the top of the bearing, it's less loaded, at the bottom of the bearing, it's loaded more. And this occurs every revolution. So you'll start to see sidebands showing up, that modulation effect. Okay, a little higher level. Uh, uh, you probably don't need to know that, but that is the failure pattern, okay? You'll get harmonics and then you'll start getting side bands. Okay, ultrasonic impacting and friction. Early failure in bearings. It doesn't mean that you replace the bearings because you see an ultrasonic sim a signature that infers that there's impacting going on. Uh, this is part of the, uh, the way bearings fatigue. And in fact, a lot of times, if you pulled out a bearing like this, um, the raceway would look perfect. Uh, a lot of impacting is from the balls rolling over a point in the raceway that has a subsurface fracture. And you'll get, it'll be a little spongier than the rest of the bearing, but it'll look beautiful. It'll look like it's a fine worn bearing, okay? Worn into the way it should be. Um, impacting, we get peaks in the spectrum, Friction comes from lubrication breakdown, where we won't get a peak in the spectrum that we're looking at, the ultrasonic spectrum. We'll get a raised noise floor, okay? and we'll show you that. Okay, what's the process? This looks complicated, but it's a really good step-by-step -step of what happens inside the ultrasonic technology. Every vendor out there has their own proprietary filtering and things like that. There's um, Spike Energy, NTech IRD, or Alan Bradley. The CSI has um, uh, peak view. There's acceleration enveloping for SKF. There's something called DMOD for DLI. There's a bunch of different technology out there, but they all behave on this pattern, this demodulation pattern. Okay, we take the ultrasonic measurement. Our first step is the raw time waveform. We press the button on our, our machine. We acquire a digitized uh, sample of this raw time waveform. 
the process now is I want to see what the high frequency looks like, what the ultrasonic looks like. I'll put it through a high pass filter or a band pass filter with the high end going pretty far out. Uh, effectively, we're getting rid of the low frequency response in the time waveform. All the big wiggles is the low frequency stuff. The hash writing on top of it is the high frequency stuff. So we put it through one of these filters, the high frequency time waveform is what we get. Okay. If we put it through a peak detector, that high frequency energy becomes a little more um, noticeable. So what we have here, if we zoom in and get our ma magnifying glass out, we see the impact rate. We also see the ringing. This is the ultrasonic part of this. Uh, that's a ring down pattern is whatever's being excited in the ultrasonic range. And usually it's the transducer itself is like a tuning fork. We're using it to see what the high frequency energy is. Uh, we're going to envelope this uh, energy. We're going to put a, a, a little cutout around it, okay, just to try to see what that rate is. Okay, there's going to be a lot of impacting in here. We want to be able to see a repeatable rate. Okay, it's not. We don't care about uh, the ringing. We only care about how often we rung the bell. Okay, so each ball hitting that spall in the raceway. Uh, next, we'll put it through a low-pass filter. We'll get rid of the ringing. We'll retain this low-frequency modified time waveform. This is the impact rate. If there's damage in the bearing, that's the rate the balls are hitting that spot on the raceway. So we do an FFT of this like we would do any signal, any time waveform. If there's damage on the raceway, we'll get this series of ball pass frequency, uh, inner, outer, ball spin frequency. It's one of those non-synchronous bearing defects. We can put our cursor on it and verify, yep, it's coming from the bearing. If there's just lubrication problems, there'll be a noise floor. And that noise floor can grow with more lubrication issues. So there's, there's rubbing, there's uh, all kinds of things that uh, can cause um, the noise floor to increase and not you know, be an impacting source. Um, so we have in a basket, that's what demodulation is, okay, and ultrasonic analysis. So the raw time waveform, we mentioned unbalanced looseness, misalignment, electrical, hydraulic, aerodynamic, bearing defects, gear meshing, everything's in there, okay? Notice I said bearing defects. That's in there too, uh, potentially. Um, but we're looking at the high frequency end of that. It's a completely different frequency range from the bearing defect range. Okay, and it won't show up any other way unless we look in a real high frequency. Put it through the bandpass or high pass filter, and it gives us only the high frequency signals. Of here's the low and the high. We want the high. We zoom in to find into the high frequency waveform. We can see the two important things: the impact ring down, which is this little fishtail ringing response, and we can see the impact rate. We don't care about the ringing. We only care about how often we rung the bell, okay? It's not the ringing of the bell that's important. Rather, it's how often you rang the bell. That's the impact rate, okay? And we can figure out where what the root cause is if we uh, look at the impact rate. We put it through uh, a lot of buzzwords with peak detection, rectification, time constant enveloping, but basically we're making a little cookie cutter cutout. It looks like a sawtooth pattern and um, it, it envelopes our faults, our, our reoccurring impacts. Put it through a low pass filter to get rid of the ringing because we don't care about the ringing, we care about the, um, uh, the impact rate. And we can trend this. And a lot of ultrasonic programs, they will do all this process just to get to the, um, I keep pointing at my screen, they keep do all this processing to get to this point and then trend this amplitude level. And if it starts to go up, then they look at the um, spectrum. Okay? And it's going to be one of two things. The energy source is lubrication breakdown or friction, no discrete peaks, just a floor noise increase or we have damage, we have an impact source, we have discrete peaks in the ultrasonic spectrum. And again, this is early. This, it, in the first couple stages of failure, you're going to go through this, where you start to see friction and you start to see uh, minor impacts. Okay, 
You'll see them later on as well, but they'll be a lot more developed. You still have uh, the years of life of the bearing. As long as you lubricate them properly um, and you don't abuse them, which we all do, you'll uh, get all the life you want out of them. Uh, okay, understanding the five failure stages. This is uh, where we've, we've run up to here. Um, we have stage zero. This is new bearing break-in period. It's in green because every bearing goes through it. We usually miss it. We don't even notice it's there. Uh, stage one, early micro level subsurface uh, damage or lubrication issues. The highest Hertzian stresses in the, in the bearing, two curved surfaces coming together, you get a big point load, but the maximum load is below the surface. So all the shear stresses uh, just slightly below the surface will break down the metal lattice. Um, okay, uh, early is stage one, uh, ongoing, it will detect them with the ultrasonics like we just talked about, ongoing early level uh, subsurface and lubrication problems, that's stage two. There's very minor things that happen uh, in, in level two, little bit of little changes. Stage three is where we wanna replace the bearing. This is really important. Macro level, there's visual damage, there's evidence that appears in the ultrasonic spectrum and the velocity spectrum. Okay, if it's in the ultrasonics and not in the velocity, it's early. If it's in both, I see a peak in my velocity spectrum it's time to change the bearing out. That doesn't mean shut the machine down and you know just go crazy. It means the next opportunity. Every Wednesday we have a an outage for a couple hours or whatever it is, and that's what it's time for. You wait till the end of the month. You wait until it's a good time. Okay. If we get to the next level, you got to shut the machine down. The stage four. So pronounced visual damage. You have velocity spectrum defects, you get harmonics and sidebands, remember we just talked about that, in the velocity spectrum. So damage is, is moving quickly. Um, stage zero, I have an ultrasonic, my graphics here, I have an ultrasonic uh, overall level that we can trend. I have an ultrasonic frequency spectrum where I just get random noise floor for the stage zero. Uh, velocity wise, uh, I'm in the green here. Uh, there's no uh, bearing defect peaks in the velocity spectrum, so I'm still trending and I'm on the low end of the curve here. So stage zero is the stage that presents very little indication in the vibration signature, but does represent a wear milestone in the run-in period of the bearing. Um, all of the wear in this stage is microscopic, properly lubricated, will deform and fracture the minor surface irregularities. You basically run in the bearing, get rid of all the machine marks and it runs uh, smooth at that point. Okay, the only uh, change in vibration can be found in the ultrasonic frequency and we, we a lot of times we miss that. I mentioned earlier, you know, 12 points a year, you know, 12 measurement points uh, as opposed to 9,000 if you had something in place and took a measurement every uh, hour. So big difference. Um, here's some real data. Here's real machining marks. Nothing uh, in the velocity spectrum. Random noise floor is what you'd expect in the ultrasonic, which would what we have. Stage one, uh, very early indications of failure. Uh, all of the bearing damage is occurring at the micro level. Most faults occur in the maximum Hertzian shear stress location, one to four mils below the metal surface, and it'll work its way until a piece of metal pops out. So it's it's a deep. Uh, subsurface uh, fracture. Uh, ultrasonic trends increase in response to friction and impacting. Uh, there could be a lubrication breakdown, they call it uh, elasto hydrodynamic lubrication or EHL. Um, you can uh, get friction uh, response from that uh, that we'll see in the ultrasonic spectrum. No real response in the velocity spectrum. Okay. Stage one, uh, failure, uh, no velocity indications, a random noise floor in the ultrasonics. If you took your bearing apart, you'd see very little indication that there's anything wrong with it. Stage two is marked by minimum, uh, minimal visual indications of distress on the bearing race rate or the rolling elements. Uh, again, it's subsurface and they're growing. Magnification may indicate early surface uh, faults or wear patterns emerging. 
um, you might start seeing the fault in the ultrasonic spectrum. So this, it's non-synchronous. It could be the outer race, the inner race, the cage, the ball spin, but something's changing. So I'm yellow here, so I'm slightly in alarm as far as the ultrasonics are concerned. Uh, this should be really green because uh, we're not in the uh, seeing anything in the velocity spectrum yet. So if you want to make a mark to your copy, uh, and I'll make it in the, the download copy if you wanted to download them those, so I'll color that green. Uh, ultrasonic trends it continue to increase. You get uh, in response to friction and impacting and lubrication. Uh, bearing defect co coefficients are not visible in the velocity spectrum. Velocity spectrum. They might be visible in the acceleration spectrum. Okay. We trend bearings in the velocity spectrum. So you may cry wolf a little too early if you uh, convert to uh, an acceleration parameter. You might see some high frequency bearing defect peaks. But until they uh, come into the velocity spectrum, uh, they're not concerned yet. Okay, We'll keep it lubricated and we'll try to keep working with it. This is a stage two, uh, some debris denting. So this roller ran across some uh, flakes of what have you, uh, something that got into the bearing and put some dents in the roller. No, nothing shows up in the velocity spectrum. This is way too minor. In the ultrasonic, you might start seeing the impacts from those. Very low level, but uh, they'll show up in the high frequency range. Stage three is where everything starts to happen, okay? We start to increase our ultrasonic response. So the bearing defect uh, is starting to grow. Uh, the overall ultrasonic energy is going up and we're in a range where we're interested in, hey, something's going on. The telltale sign is the velocity response is going up and I get a non-synchronous peak in my velocity spectrum. If I have a bearing related non-synchronous peak in the velocity spectrum, it's time to change the bearing out. On a schedule, no, no rapid response required, but you have to get the bearing out. The damage is in there and it's just gonna get worse. I don't know how long it'll last. No one will be able to tell you that. It could last three weeks. It could last an hour. It could uh, last for, I have one application. It was oh, 12 years ago in a cement plant. Uh, a big fan had a, a giant peak and it was right at a bearing defect. It was in the velocity spectrum. It was, I thought it was gonna fail right there that I wouldn't be able to you know, complete the job I was working on it's still running. They haven't changed the bearing out. And it was 12 years. Some, some will defy all logic. Okay. But this is about how 80% of the bearings fail. The other 20% will fail pretty much any way they want. Um, so ultrasonic velocity response, you get a peak in the velocity spectrum. So stage three is where you want to do something. Okay regardless of amplitude, the bearing should be scheduled for replacement the next opportunity. Doesn't matter how big this is. Doesn't matter if it exceeds this alarm level. These alarm levels are for bearing defects should be set up as power type alarms, energy type alarms, not threshold alarms. And in your database, you can pick both if you like. And I usually set them up for both just to be safe. Um, this is a classic subsurface fracture. You can see the deep edges on the sides here, a couple of initiation points. So the balls are rolling across this. It's several mils below the surface and it, it fractures and it starts growing and then a piece pops out. Okay. Very uh, active, at least this one in the velocity spectrum, non-synchronous peaks. There's some side bands around them. So they have modulation as well as um, bearing uh, defects and uh, harmonics of bearing defects. In the ultrasonic spectrum, very defined non-synchronous frequencies. And we can uh, relate these back to the inner race, outer race, or you know, the ball spin or the cage frequency. Stage four, everything goes wild, okay? You're continuing, your ultrasonic trend will go up. You'll get to a point where it'll be high and then a lot of times it'll drop off. And this is due to um, 
defects in the raceway that are smoothed over by the balls. The sharp corners start start to get rounded off. You still have a, a massive, you know, spalls on the raceway, but they're they're kind of cleaning some of the debris out. Okay, you'll see a drop in energy and then a real high spike in energy. So this could be hours, uh, days, what have you, where it, it just goes, uh, but really takes off. If you're in this stage, uh, you need to stop the machine and change the bearing. Uh, ultrasonics, these will continue to grow in amplitude. Uh, the velocity response will get high. It'll have the same drop off, depending on how damaged the bearing is. Um, we will see non-synchronous frequencies. We'll see harmonics of that same non-synchronous frequency. We might see sidebands, depending on um, if it's an inner or outer ace defect and eminent failure. Okay. Uh, Okay, here's a stage four failure. This was a, a vertical pump in a nuclear plant, or actually this was the motor, but it was the also uh, provided thrust and it held the rotor in place. Um, they wanted, to, this was in May, they wanted to know if it could go until uh, October, and I said I wouldn't bet on it. And they had um, no extra shaft, no extra motor, no extra pump. So they shut down. And when they shut down, we found this massive sprawl. sprawl. Uh, there was uh, metal all the way inside the, the bearing case. It was just pieces of this were just coming apart. So lots of non-synchronous peaks. Notice none of these peaks exceed that threshold. Okay. What did I say about non-synchronous peaks? They're not set up to be a threshold limitation. They're set up to be a power band type response. So really it's a root sum squared of each individual peak in this frequency segment. If all that energy is above the RSS level, root sum squared, it uh, will go into alarm. And this had lots of peaks then, lots of energy. And in the ultrasonic, we'd see them as well. So this had an outer race defect. It had side bands of cage frequency. Uh, so it had some strange modulation going on eminent failure. Uh, there is no rules of thumb on this. Uh, it's your own fault if you let it go that far. Uh, and I've seen some real catastrophic failures. And uh, once you start seeing those peaks in the velocity spectrum, it's it's a quick train ride to, to looking like this. So not to scare you or anything, but um, there are eminent failures that happen all the time. Okay. The last section here, low speed bearing failure and the time waveform analysis methods. This is that same bearing. This is the one in the nuclear plant that I just mentioned. This is the spectrum. And there's a lot of sidebands. There's uh, inner race defect going on, uh, just lots of noise. And it's all bearing related. Um, they had the same idea. They said, well, none of it's in alarm. And it, that isn't how those alarms work that I mentioned already. Uh, I gave them a secondary example of the time waveform. So this confirms that there is imminent bearing failure. This was February, March, April, and then right at the end of April, effectively May. So this shows the modulation. So it's pulsing because of all the energy. So these rollers going in and out of the loads and, and every impact is, is increased. So within uh, two months, they were already, you know, right there as far as failing quickly. So at least stage four. This is a low speed bearing failure in a paper plant. You can see a, it's a massive fracture. It's, uh, this was a very low speed uh, machine. I can't even remember what it was, but it was like 300, 250 RPM, something like that. The spectrum didn't really show anything. The time waveform showed the impact rate. So we could go in and say, yep, the impact rate equates to the inner race of the bearing. And, and uh, they opened it up, and this is what they saw. And thankfully, they took a picture because it was it, you don't see a lot of these. So it's real interesting to me. This is an uh, inner race bearing defect going in and out of the load zone and the beating that goes on. And the best way to see this beating or this modulation, it'll be sidebands in the time wave or in the spectrum, 
it'll be um, this lobing effect, this beat frequency in the time waveform. So uh, it's good not to rely on one, look at both. You know, they're always going to ask you how long it's going to last, and, uh, you know, you don't know. The answer is I have the slightest idea. If it's a Friday, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail Saturday. That's what I always tell people. And, you know, oh, okay, yeah, you'll have to go in on a Saturday because you'd rather not fix it on a Friday. Well, it'll, it'll be a problem. Um, okay, in the load zone, you get the highest response out of the load zone to top of the bearing. You get uh, less loading, so you can see this, this beating factor that goes on. All right. Uh, more information, you can contact me. I think uh, the guys at Grace said, uh, you know, 15-minute phone calls or something is, is pretty common. Uh, I don't have any problem with that at all. Um, contact me if you have any, any questions, need more information, you're interested in the vibration fault periodic table. I do a lot of training, uh, online training with that. And uh, thanks for your time. Uh, I guess there's questions now. Um, and be happy to answer some of them as much time as we have left. You guys still awake out there? Yep. So Dan, we got we got a couple of questions for you that came in during the presentation. Can can you yep. hear us from here? Yep. All right. so, yep. uh, the first of which uh, is um, referring. Let's see back in time to when this this happened. I, I think we were talking about um, you know the, the frequency related analysis you you were doing. Um, can such analysis notify maintenance that bearing lubrication is due? Um, how will the frequency of freshly lubricated bearings compare with dry bearings? And, uh, you know, just, just basically some comments uh, generically about that. Um, yeah, lubrication. This is, um, you know, stage zero, but I think I have the same one for stage one. This is an ultrasonic spectrum um, for a lubrication friction buildup. So the distinction between uh, a lubricated bearing and a dry bearing is just uh, like a carpet level. It'll go up, up and down with uh, that loss of lubrication, that extra friction energy. There should be no peaks in it, no discernible, you know, uh, bearing defect damage peaks. Um, but the floor noise will go up quite a bit. Um, I don't know how long a bearing will last dry, running dry. Uh, we tried this. A friend of mine worked for NSK Bearings, and they do all kinds of bearing testing. They might have a lot of 100 bearings going at once. They're all with the same load and the same lubrication and things like that, and they try to see how long they're going to last. So that's the L10 life of the bearing. Um, in this case, they, they took all the oil out. They cleaned out all the bearings, and they thought they could accelerate the wear pattern, and it still took a really long time to get a change in the ultrasonic level. It was kind of surprising. Um, there's too many conditions. You know, you can do this ultrasonic um, analysis. You can put a flyer in there. If I have a high um, high ultrasonic signature or a high trend in level, uh, activate the lubrication guys to go and, and do a lube, uh, add lube or whatever, uh, score degrees or whatever it takes. Um, another cautionary thing is you can over lubricate, okay? You can have under lubrication, you can have over lubrication where you, um, you, you don't have any room in the bearing anymore. It's a very high stress condition if you're plowing through grease in a, a rolling element bearing. But um, you won't see any peaks, you'll see noise floor increase. Hopefully that's a, a decent answer. Anything, uh, anything else? Yep. So um, early on, when you were showing the, uh, the periodic table there, um, uh, there was a question about why the, the natural frequency fault was gray or not gray, excuse me, in I think a year. You, yeah. Yep. Yeah, you got yeah. it there. Natural frequencies are a function of mass and stiffness. OK, if you have a, a just a beam or something you and you ring it like a bell, it's going to, you know, flex, but it's ringing frequency depends on how stiff that beam is and how much mass is there. It doesn't depend on um, any other frequency response. You do need something to drive it, okay? So if this was a foundation that a motor was sitting on and the foundation was vibrating, um, 
it's because the mass and stiffness in that uh, foundation matched the synchronous speed, okay, or the a harmonic or a, a bearing defect. There was some frequency that was close to that natural frequency to amplify it. So the reason I left it there is because this natural frequency could have the mass and stiffness so that it's its natural frequency is very close to the turning speed of the shaft, which happens quite a bit. And if that's the case, I can amplify it. It might be the residual unbalance or slight misalignment or um, what have you, uh, but it gives it more energy and it can amplify it like a tuning fork. Okay, um, next one up here is, is it worth storing time waveform data um, on a route if the machine's rotational speed is between 1800 and 3600 RPM? No, uh, the only time you would do that is if you had a gearbox. If you have a gearbox, this fault on the table, the gear tooth fault, is the only one that you won't pick up in the spectrum. Okay, you'll pick it up in the time waveform. Okay, so if I have a broken tooth in my gearbox or a fractured tooth, um, every time it goes into mesh, it's at one times RPM. Okay, the teeth are changing the speeds of the gears, but the the impact rate is one times RPM. You'll see that in the spectrum or in the time waveform much more effectively than in the spectrum. Okay, so if I have a, a a machine that's a higher speed, you don't need to collect time waveforms. If it's a gearbox, you have to because you potentially have broken teeth. Um, and I guess in the in the gearbox case, I would also do uh, oil analysis on it uh, as often as possible because you'll pick up uh, metal filings in the oil uh, faster than you'll find a, a cracked tooth or a you know wear damage. Good enough? I think, I think so. Um, all right, next one up here is uh, how would fluting due to bearing currents show up in the, uh, from a vibration perspective? Uh, fluting is uh, a modulation type fault. Fluting is electro erosion of the bearing raceways, one or more or both or all of them. Um, it looks like a washboard pattern on a um, – a gravel road after a rain or something, you'll get these th these lines uh, going across. So as the rolling elements cross those lines, they'll excite what is very likely a natural frequency out in high frequency range. This natural frequency will have side bands of the inner race fault or the outer race fault. So if I have little fluting on the, uh, let's say the outer race, uh, I will see a peak in the high frequency spectrum the, and sideband spacings at um, the outer race defect frequency. Um, that's what, how it will look. If you have fluting damage, the bearing's done. It's pretty much toast. You need to replace the bearing. Uh, and it'll, it'll pass that fault onto the other raceway surfaces and rolling element surfaces. Okay. But it's a modulation type fault. Uh, the how it relates to running speed, um, plus or minus so many times running speed, uh, it can show up as a, a sideband, uh, either a, a harmonic sideband or a non-synchronous sideband. That's about all I got for that. Okay, uh, so we've got one that the GRACE team here can take. Um, the question is, is the, uh, the GRACE sensing suite able to integrate into an RS Logics 5000? Um, and uh, I've, I've got kind of a couple of updates on that front. Um, in quarter one of next year, we will be uh, kind of launching a new product extension, which will enable all of our IIoT products, uh, including the uh, the you know vibration capabilities that we've been talking about today to just nicely integrate into a, a existing Rockwell system or um, you know other control uh, SCADA PLC whatever it is uh, in, in kind of the standard industrial protocols that that you would expect to see. Um, so that 
uh, kind of keep, keep your ears out for uh, notices of that. Uh, we did demonstrate that initial functionality out at, at Automation Fair. Um, so that's that's coming in the next, uh, next quarter, um, as well as uh, a second product in our vibration line, which will really target the more ultrasonic spectrum that Dan's been talking about a lot. So that'll get, get us to uh, a higher frequency bandwidth than uh, our first SKU in that line is, is capable of, of recording. Um, uh, the other thing I just want to touch on, because we've seen a lot of questions on that, uh, the the uh, record, or excuse me, the the presentation itself is downloadable from the um, what is it the handout the handout section uh, of the of, of the screen, so you can capture that now. We also after uh, after we close the session, we'll make uh, the recording available to to all attendees. So you should you see an email. Yeah, um, yeah. There, uh, so that that'll be available not long after after we close the recording. Um, and another just administrative thing, um, it'd be great if folks could to, could take the uh, the survey uh, that's provided to you afterwards. Anytime, any feedback we can get on these things is is great from from our perspective to make them better uh, in the future. So, Dan, I got a couple more here. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right. Um, all right. So, um, all right. Here's here's a question. How how is mechanical vibration analysis compared uh, to electrical vibration? Uh, do you recommend to use electrical vibration if motor current sensors are available and uh, no mechanical vibration sensors are available? Well, um, vibration analysis is mechanical. It's picking these 35 faults. They're picking up mechanical faults and electrical faults. There's a uh, line frequency can show up. Uh, pole passing frequency if you have damage to the rotor bars. Um, there's other damage to the rotor bars that'll show up at rotor bar pass frequency. Um, DC motors will pick up uh, faults. If I have VFD issues on, uh, that are on induction motors, uh, we can pick up those faults as well. Um, so they're mechanical and electrical. The faults, the electrical vibration that you're talking about, I believe is uh, motor current analysis or different motor tests that uh, might predict something as far as a failure. So motor current analysis will, will do a, a motor um, current spectrum and it'll, it'll look for um, the strength of the sideband. I don't know how to uh, say it a little easier than that, but if there's some signature in that that will pick up uh, how many rotor bars are broken or potentially how many are broken. Um, and you can go from there. Usually the the electric, the motor current test is after you've already done the mechanical test where you've, you've said, hey, we have a rotor bar problem or we have a pull pass, bearing, uh, pull pass frequency problem indicating some uh, damage to or porosity in a cast motor. Then you go and do the motor current and see if you can verify that. Right, and, and Dan, just to to that to jump on top of that, I think that's that gets to to the main point here that sometimes the vibration alerts you of the issue, um, and you know a lot of times there is an electrical kind of root cause to the problem, um, and you know we we certainly yeah there there are kind of secondary methods, including you know we do have current current sensing capabilities inside our our system as well uh, that can definitely couple nicely with with the vibration analysis to get a little bit bigger, fuller picture of, you know, not only the the real-time health of a piece of rotating equipment, but, you know, potentially also the root causes of any degradation inside there. Yep, I agree. All right, uh, I got, got one here at the bottom. Um, how does a worn shaft or a worn housing affect harmonics? A worn shaft or a worn housing? Um... Not sure exactly what that would be. Oh well, the harmonics. I maybe you're talking about loose fits. Um, if a bearing's fit is loose in the housing or in the um, on the shaft, uh, that will generate uh, fretting corrosion in the two surfaces. At which fretting, you know, most people think it's more of a, a friction or a movement type thing, but actually it's more of a corrosion issue. Um, and this can generate lots of harmonics. So it would be a mechanical looseness type C type problem where you generate a whole string of one times RPM uh, multiples out there. 
uh, and floor noise when it gets really bad. Um, I think that's what you want to talk or what you're talking about. You can also have loose fits of the gears on the shaft, uh, the bearings on the shaft, the uh, impellers, anything that uh, is attached to the shaft that has a loose fit, it falls into that mechanical looseness type C uh, fault parameter. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna simplify this question a, a little bit, but um, if we talk about predicting failures, um, the, the question is kind of alluding to are there are there ways to simulate a system um, in a, uh, you know using kind of computer aided approaches in order to help help us predict you know vibration related failure? Um, yes, uh, I do a lot of this. I do um, natural frequency testing. So your natural frequency is your, your guy right here. Um, and the real condition is a resonance problem. So if that natural frequency, and we touched on it earlier, is, is uh, um, composed of a, a mass and a stiffness, it can shift around in the frequency range and uh, you can have sources of vibration that can come from anywhere. Um, some of the testing I do is the shut the machine down, I, I ring it with a hammer, it's called a modal test it tells me where all the natural frequencies are in the system. So it's a good thing to do, especially if you're planning on, you know, changing your VFD settings or going to higher speeds, uh, paper plants, um, aluminum plants, steel plants, all thrive on more production, but a lot of their machines are not designed for that. So I might have a structure that's supporting my machine that's resonant at a certain frequency range, and I might be moving right into that range. So you can do natural frequency testing to um, find those peaks. You can do finite element analysis to build a model of that um, and correlate it with your real data so that you get a good numbers and you can forecast what happens if you uh, put a stiffener here or add mass to a certain location, how you can move the resonances around. Um, I, think, I think I've answered it. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, I got I got a, a less technical one. Uh, can you explain what the dot or the dotted lines at the bottom of the table mean? Yes, I kind of left that off because it was um, um, a distraction for for what we were talking about today. These dotted lines down here uh, are shown as a fault and how they occur, and then what happens as well. They're they're a modulation fault but they're also a harmonic fault. So rotor bar pass frequency. Uh, we'll, my example was there's 48 rotor bars, I'll get exactly 48 times running speed. And that'll show up in my spectrum. But it, the rotor bars will pulse, or the, uh, they will amplify two times line frequency. So every time you pull it, your polarity changes in the motor where your, your magnetic field swaps so that you're being pulled to the next location and then you're repelled and it works its way around. So all those 48 rotor bars are magnets that are pulling on the rotor and, and swapping that magnetic field so that that swapping effect is a modulation. So it'll show up as, as sidebands in the spectrum. I'll see rotor bar frequency and then I'll see twice line frequency sidebands around it. And it, it's a fault with multiple um, attributes. So it's a harmonic fault, but it's also a modulation. Uh, same thing with uh, the cage frequency. Uh, I can have sidebands that are generated um, and it's a modulation type event on, on different bearing faults. Same thing with uh, pull pass frequency. It'll generate sidebands, but it's also a frequency itself and hunting tooth type problems. So one of the gearbox problems has, it'll produce a, a, a frequency and it'll show up as sidebands. So uh, modulation. Good. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll leave it open maybe for another few seconds here. If anyone wants to chime in with another question. Um, you know, and kind of, kind of as we close here, I guess just on behalf of all of us here at Grace and Dan, you know, we appreciate uh, your attendance, and you know, definitely feel free to to reach out with any future questions um, uh, for for anybody on the on the team here. So, and yeah, yeah, be 
sure to take the survey on the way out. There also will be a follow-up email within the next hour or so from GoToWebinar. It's an automated email that'll include your certificate and a link back to that survey if you didn't have time to take it on your way out. Uh, we will also be editing this video from today. We'll send out an email to the on-demand link. You guys can watch that anytime. That'll be going out within the next couple of days. Uh, one of our products from the Grace Sense Predictive Maintenance System has been nominated for Product of the Year by Plant Engineering. So we're going to plug that. We're going to show you that page on the email going out. Um, and if you want, you can vote for us to win. So thank you all for attending. We appreciate it. Dan, thank you so much for presenting. I think this is the longest we've gone over. Uh, <laughs> so. Sorry about that. No, but that's good. That's I'm glad people were this engaged. So. Thanks again uh, for your excellent presentation. Um, I think we can close it out. It looks like it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Ian. All right. We'll talk to you later. See you, everybody.